very happy to be live with you, Lancaster. Start us off with an intro to yourself and your book. Hello everyone, um, I'm Neil Lancaster. I live up here in the Scottish Highlands. It's a beautiful evening out there now. I wish I could show you, but it would mean moving the computer and that would get all ugly because there's wires connected everywhere. I'm the author of two series. My first series is the uh, the Novak series, um, that are sort of action adventure thrillers. The last one of them came out in 2020. Uh, since then, I wrote I started the Max Craigie series, which started off with Dead Man's Grave. And uh, there have been three others since then. And the most recent one came out a week ago yesterday, which was Blood Runs Cold, which is the fourth edition of Max Craigie. Um, it's a, a book that centres around trafficking, human trafficking. Um, it talks about a young traffic, trafficking victim, victim called Aphrodita Dushka, who's brought to the UK by a trafficking gang, and she's put into slavery, basically, selling and, and running drugs um, for an Albanian gang. But then she's rescued by the police, and she's successfully fostered into a placement in the Scottish Highlands. And uh, But the gang aren't happy, and they want her back. And then one day, she goes for a run. Um, she becomes, she discovers athletics. She's only 12, and she's when she's trafficked and then at age nearly 15, she is a really, really successful young athlete. And she goes for a run up a, a, a small Munro near where I live here called Firish, where upon she gets abducted again. And it's a race against time thriller. Can Max Craigie and Janie and the rest of the team, so we're talking about Ross, Barney and Norma, can they find her before it's too late? And it goes to the heart of, it talks about themes around human trafficking, around exploitation, around corruption, about the roots to corruption, or about why people may be corrupted, which is something that endlessly fascinates me. So in, in a sort of very potted history, that's kind of what the book's about. Um, I'm really pleased with it. It went out a week ago. Um, it's my most ambitious book so far. Um, and I think it might be my best book so far um, until the next one, hopefully. So, yeah, that's it. Blood Runs Cold. I'm the, I'm really happy with it and I'm really pleased with it. So um, it, it's exciting to have it out there. No, it, I mean, you, you said it involves trafficking and things. That's a quite a, a dark subject to go into, isn't it? You don't really pull any punches. Well, no, because it is. But an incredibly dark situation. I worked, I mean, obviously most of you know, anyone who's watching probably knows I was a police officer for 25 years in London and trafficking became a speciality and a bit, an area of expertise for me. Um, when I was seconded for the last five years of my service, I was actually working for the Home Office um, Immigration Department on what they called um, crime and financial investigations. So we would, we would investigate organized immigration crime and one of the crimes around that we would investigate are the breaches where people are brought into the UK. Now, that's either uh, they're either brought willingly, even though we know which you might be sort of call human smuggling. So it's getting people in who want to just want to come. Or it could be trafficking, which is where you bring somebody over to the UK or move somebody around within the UK with the intent. Um, intent of exploiting them onwards which t tends to mean sexual exploitation uh or human slavery unpaid work things like that well of course they want aphrodita over here and they want her back and they want to put her into because she's a she's an attractive young girl and they see her as a, a, a cash cow they think they can make money off her by putting her into prostitution um so yes i explore some deep some dark some horrible themes um but this is the reality of it. And I, I experienced it. You know, I investigated it. I, I dealt the last big case I dealt with was an Albanian gang, which was bringing uh, young women over to the UK through something that was called the little loophole. They would um, they would get because once the way the Schengen agreement goes, I mean, from the, you can go from Albania to Italy with pretty much no checks. Once you're in Italy, you can then traverse Europe because of the Schengen agreement. You don't you know, there are no borders. You can just drive. You can then get yourself all the way to um, to, to Brussels and you can then 
buy yourself a train ticket. It's as simple as that. And they used to buy a train ticket to go to Lille. But then they wouldn't get off at Lille. They would stay on the train and they would, of course, turn up at St Pancras and they would then encounter Border Force who would obviously say, and they would say, because they would get rid of their passports on the journey and they would say, we wish to claim asylum. And because this gang predominantly brought in young women uh, or children or, young, you know, 14 year olds, 15 year olds, etc. Um, and because of the fact that the Home Office didn't have suitable accommodation, they would be given temporary release, which meant they disappeared and they disappeared into the underworld and they, they disappeared into the cannabis farms. They disappeared into into unpaid work. They disappeared into uh, prostitution. Um, so it's real, you know, and I know it is a dark subject and the people I talk about are pretty hideous. You know, the guy at the top of this, the guy at the top of this tree um, is is a really bad man. It's as bad as it's possible to imagine. And that's intent. I wanted people to, I wanted him to be skin crawlingly evil. Um, and I think he was. No, he really is. He, yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I'm proud of that. You know, I'm proud because these people are bad people. And, uh, you know, and the Albanian gangs, I don't want to focus on one nationality, but it is a it is a, a, a pure fact that Albanian gangs control cocaine distribution in this country. That's a fact. They have a, a direct relationship with the Colombian cartels. They have a good relationship with the Italian mafia. Thus, they are able to bring very high purity cocaine into the UK, which they then sell on at a very good price compared to what your traditional gangsters used to bring in and they, you know, they go and get it in Holland, bring it in. They charge it out much, but much more expensive and at a much worse purity. The Albanian gangs are bringing it in and they're selling it cheaper, but at a much higher purity level. So there's more profit in it for everybody along the way. So they have very, very quickly grabbed hold of the cocaine market in the UK, apart from Liverpool, the Scousers, they, they can't deal with the Scousers. Um, so, yeah, that's something else I wanted to talk about, because, again, it's real. It's real life. I love to talk about things that I know are true. Um, but what I do is I, I obviously I bring drama into it and I bring, you know, the fact that this is it is work fiction. It's all, you know, it's part of, my, you know, something I've just plucked out of my head. And so I then try and see how would we tackle it? And I just think that how would I tackle the situation if I was a cop? What would I have done if I had access to all the resources and the expertise and things like that, which of course, so I just can just create the resources. Like I can create the expertise. I can just invent Barney out of my head and say that I'm going to bring Barney in because Barney can do anything with anything to do with technical surveillance, anything to do uh, computers, anything to do with IT with surveillance equipment. Barney can do it all because he's this ex spy. And um, and then I thought, well, how about how about Barney's really old? How about he's quite old and. He's a bluff Yorkshireman and he's not what you'd expect and nothing ever phases him. And he's just turned to be my favourite character in the whole series. I think he's the most fun to write. You know, this guy in his carpet slippers and his cardigan smoking his roll ups, not getting enough, you know, fussed by anything. It's just terrific. So, yeah, it's, it's been a great it's been a huge amount of fun to write the whole series. But particularly Blood Runs Cold so far has been the greatest fun to write. Yeah, and I guess before we move on, when we're talking about the dark topics, it's important to kind of address those in fiction so that people know more about them. I want to shine a light on this stuff because I've, I've experienced it firsthand. It was in the news quite recently, wasn't it, that the home horses were just losing miners. They're losing these young girls. And it nearly it very often is young girls. They come over now because the little loophole, as was, has been closed. Quite simply, they moved the platforms. <coughs> Bless you. They they moved the platforms around. So if you want to go to Lil, you have to go on a different platform. You if you want sorry, if you want to go to St Pancras, you have to get on a, a completely different um platform to people who want to go, get off at, at Lil. So they kind of solved it. So Obviously, now people will get on these small boats. So you've got these people turning up on small boats and the Home Office just doesn't know what to do with them because there isn't the places to send them to. They can't keep them in secure accommodation because it just isn't there. It doesn't exist. You know, so they put them in these hotels all throughout the country. So you can find yourself, that you know, your, your best Western in Macclesfield or something can be 
taken over by the Home Office and it will be filled full of asylum seekers, which creates all sorts of problems, which is something I want to talk about in a future book with hideous people turning up and deciding to vent their frustrations on these many of them, these, these disadvantaged people who tried to come to the you know, trying to come to the UK to in search of a better life. So these are themes I, I do want to shine a light on. And I, I've always gone and that you know, is, is what I want to do every time I I I start a new book. I think what is what's this about? What's this book about? What what am I shining? What am I trying to, to highlight here? Because I'm in a privileged position because I've I've done the job for real. I know what's real. I know what's really happening. Um, so how how can I, without giving away too many trade secrets, how how can I bring this to the attention of people who like to read my books? Because you know, quite a few people are reading the books now. So it's it, it's good to be able to actually to, to bring this to the fore and to make people think and and to make people think that there are success stories out there you know there's a lot of difficulty out there but my, my wife is a social worker my wife is a fostering uh well it certainly was a fostering and adoption and social worker so valerie and reg who are uh aphrodita's foster carers in the highlands in the book they're actually real people they're real people. They're actually fans of the book. And my, my wife used to work with them. And um, they were fans of the book. They really loved, you know, they loved the books. And they said, oh, it's great. We love the books. We love the books. And my wife said to me, do you think you could name a couple of characters after Valerie and Reg? And I said, yeah, why not? And when it came to the fact that I was going to be needing a couple of foster carers, obviously it made total sense that I brought in Valerie and Reg. And as often happens when I introduce somebody into the book, they take on a life of their own and they end up being really big central parts of, of of the story and Valerie and Reg and have an enormous part in this story. So it's great. It's great to be able to go and, and think about things that I know and think of things that are real life and, and bring them into these stories so that, um, you know, it, it just has a bit more resonance for me and makes me feel good when I've written these stories and put these people at the front of them who are real people and who are out there doing really great stuff. So that's a real privilege to do. We've got some hellos before we get started. We've got hello. hellos from Sarah, yeah. Donna, Laura. Hello, Donna. Hello, Laura. Laura. Hello, Laura's Mills. Fan of your series. She's looking forward yeah. to reading this one. Mills is there. I know Leslie Mills. Lloyd yeah. Hello. And there's Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Yeah, Leslie Lloyd has said hello as well. That's great. Lovely to see you all. Mills thinks you do a very good job of shining a light on the darkness. Well, that's kind of the truth. That's what I, I hope to do because, um, you know, it's not, I mean, police officers, you know, God, police are getting a terrible kick in at the moment. And a lot of it is deserved. I'm not going to run away from that. And to tell you what, if you want to buy the Express tomorrow, you'll see my opinions on it because I've got I've got a, a piece in the Express tomorrow. So, you know, maybe Google that tomorrow and see what, see what I've got to say about that. Um, but yeah, there are some. You know, a lot of the themes I talk about are really dark and really, really hard. But I, 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 I realise if I didn't introduce something else into the books, they would be a grim read, and I, I don't want a grim read because that's not. Again, I, I'm really keen to try and reflect what the truth of it is and how it actually is, as much as I humanly can. So I do try to make it funny. I do try to make. I, I, I hope people are laughing. I hope people put the books down and have to have a little giggle when they're when they're reading some of the. You know, but it's all down to the interactions. It's down to to the personalities and the characters that you create, and they grow. You allow these characters to breathe, and you allow them to grow and develop, and their personalities to come through. And you know, I love. I just love Barney. Was just came out of nowhere when it, I wrote him. I put him into the second book, just because I wanted somebody to know about the technical stuff. And then I thought, well, you know, you the, the temptation is to do sort of someone young or nerdy or like X, you know, this, that, and the other. And I thought, what about if he's an old boy with cardigans who smokes roll-ups and he's just a sardonic bluff Yorkshireman? That would be quite funny, wouldn't it? And then he is, because nothing bothers him ever. Nothing. The world could be on fire. And he would go, oh, you know, no, no, no point worried about it, is there? And that makes me laugh. And the fact is that, that your Yorkshire accent. Yeah, yeah, my wife's from Yorkshire, so it's a, it's a bad one, obviously. <laughs> so, so yeah, so so, but it, it does. It made me laugh, and and the, the and I could just imagine it. I can just imagine that's how it'd be. So you've got I me, mean, Ross Fraser, who's like foul-mouthed, disgusting, appalling human being, 
but he's really good. He's a good person. He's, his heart, he's a really good person. He really cares about his people. And he's a big softy, really. But it, it just makes me laugh all the time when I, I just sit there and I'll, I'll be chuckling away as I'm coming up with this and I'm imagining these scenes with Barney and Ross, with Ross going mental at Barney because of, for whatever reason, and, you know, foul language and Barney just sitting there shrugging, you know, and just smiling. And it just makes me just makes me chuckle. And, and that's what the privilege is, is to sort of imagine these characters. And I think it's what one of my favourite reviews I've had so far. And it wasn't from a celebrity author or anything like that. It was something on NetGalley. And I don't know who it is. But she said that reading the books is like catching up with old friends. And I thought, wow, that is so nice, you know. Because whereas I hope the stories are great and they're compelling and fast paced and fast moving and intriguing and tense and all that, it, it's the characters that I'm proud of. It's the characters and how they interact together and and the fun they have together and, and the banter that that actually makes me really enjoy writing the books. Um, so that's yeah. So I don't even know what the question was. I've gone so far off the point. That's all, always the way with me. But I mean, the cast of characters is absolutely brilliant. And Barney, I, I loved him, but um, I'm the child of a Yorkshireman. Yeah. I fell in love with one. Um, I'm married to a Yorkshireman. So. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm married to a Yorkshireman. No, yeah. I'm, my, my wife is from Bingley, so that's what made that's what made me make him from Yorkshire. And plus, it's just the accent, isn't it? You can just – because I like to do it in my head. And I've got, I've, I've got the most amazing audiobook narrator who is – Honestly, he's got his own legion of fans that buy my books because he's read them. Angus King. He also narrates um, J.D. Kirk. He's now narrating Ed James books. Uh, Neil Broadfoot. Um, I think he um, I think he narrated Shuggy Bane. He did, actually did. He narrated Shuggy Bane, which won the Booker Prize. We all know. And he is the nicest guy. And he's just got it. He just get he gets the characters. And we've had some back and forth on him again. And he was saying that. Um, he could just imagine that Barney, you know, because Barney's an old boy, and he says, oh, you've got to write a, a prequel that's just about Barney, and it's quite tempting, actually. And he said that, you know, the Berlin Wall's far falling, and Barney will go, oh, all right, it's all gone. I'll, I'll be off then, you know. And that just <laughs> that just makes me laugh. And you know, I, sorry, sorry, carry on, carry on. Look, you've got in the um, the back of the, the copy, I, I got, I think mine's like a proof one. They got sent to me, but in the back of it, there's a story, isn't there? Oh, it's a short story. Oh, yeah. So you yeah. could do something like that for Barney. Oh, yeah. No, honestly, I could, I could, Barney would be a, an absolute gift. The only thing is, I'd probably to do a really good standalone for Barney. I'd have to go back in time. Um, I, uh, and uh, writing a, writing what you might, you might call a historical novel now. But I'm probably going back to about 1990 or something like that. <laughs> you've got to get the research. You've got to research it. You've got to get that right. You've got to remember. I mean, at least I was there in the 1990. You know, if you, other historical writers, you've got to pour over books. I mean, at least I can remember what it was like to be in 1990. So, yeah, I mean, the, in the back of Blood Runs Cold, I think it's only it's an exclusive in the hardback is a Janie. And it did go in the proofs as well. Is a Janie, um, a Janie short story. Um, which is a, I'm you know quite chuffed about that could have morphed into a into a book really, um, but I sort of wrapped that one up in a three thousand word short story. But I'm really yeah, I'm really pleased with that. It is a really um, good short story. And yeah, it, it no. feels very genuine. From all I know of her is from this book. Cause it's the only one of yours I've read so far. It won't be the only one, but <laughs> <laughs> it is to date. But it felt very true to her character from what I'd read in the book if that makes sense so I went back yeah and it just felt yeah. very well again it was in fact my, my wife my wife came up with the idea actually um it, so they said can you write can you knock up a short story so we can do it for a, like an exclusive um, hardback extra I said well I'll give it a shot and um as my wife said what about it? like drink spiking and I thought well, that's a good idea but I'll do it I'll go back in time so I went back to when Janie was at university and it, I thought I'd just do it to give it as a motivation as to why she became a cop. And, um, yeah, that was really, really good fun to do. I, I mean, I've done, I haven't done many short stories. I think I've written three short stories. Um, I did a, I did a prequel for the, my first book, Dead Man's Grave, which is about a feud that comes from 1830 back into the modern day. I, um, which he, I, I wrote, um, I wrote what happened in 1830 
And I wrote it into the book initially, but my editor at the time, he said, I'm not sure we can put this in the book because if we put it, it only belongs at the start. And if we if we put it at the start, anybody picking it up and reading it will think, oh, it's historical crime or historical fiction. I don't want to read that. So he said, I, don't, I think we'll have to take it out, which is a, I thought that's a shame because it's, it's good and it sort of sets it. So I thought, well, I'll just give it away as a short story. So if anybody, if you sign up for my mailing list, you get it free as a as, as a short story, you, um, along with a, a Novak short story, which is a really good, actually. It's a really good short story um, <laughs> around, around, yeah, I know, I say so myself. And um, that's around a, a, a really dangerous new form of methamphetamine that he wants to sort of stop getting into the UK. And then I did a, I did like this secret psychometric evaluation of Novak the, in, from the first book because he's a bit of a psychopath, really. And that was a bit of a laugh to do. So, um, yeah, I, I need to do some more things like that. And um, I've, I've been so busy is the thing because I've been writing two Craigies a year since I started. I mean, I, I'm sitting here now. And I still can't believe it. I'm about to do tomorrow. I'm doing an event. At, well, I'm not, doing, not tomorrow. Tomorrow, Cromarty Crime and Thrillers starts. Cromarty is a little seaside village about uh, 50 minutes away from where I live in the Highlands. Um, a really stunningly beautiful place. And they have a really good cr uh, crime festival once a year. Really small thing, but it's really great. I'm on on Sunday with Mark Billingham. Um, but tomorrow he's got Lynn Anderson and people like that. On. And um, yeah, four years ago was my first ever appearance at any festival where I appeared before Lynn Anderson um, doing like a spotlight show. And that was with my first book, Going Dark, which is the first of the Novak thrillers, which I released in 2019. And four years later... I've just finished writing my 10th book. Wow. Yeah. You know, and that just feels, oh, look, I mean, look, if JD Kirk was watching this, he'd be going, what? Is that all? Oh, he's done about 20 odd. Um, but um, yeah, it just feels like it's been a, it, it's been a long haul. It's, I mean, it's great fun. I mean, God, it's such good fun to do. I, you know, I enjoy every minute of it. Pause We've got loads of comments coming in. Laura and Sarah are both saying that the 1990s passes as historical. Yeah, I know. And that's really shocking. I joined the Met Police in 1990. And um, that was after six years in the Air Force. So that makes me really old, doesn't it? And we say, so yeah, I actually am so tempted to do that one day. If I get some, if I get some time, and I might do, because I'm, I'm slowing down. I mean, I'm, not everyone's going to want to hear this, but we're going down to one Craigie a year. Um, the next Craigie, Craigie 5, won't be out till March next year. And then Craigie 6 will be out the year after that. Um, so we're going on to a bit of a normal thing because it's for all sorts of reasons, mainly around marketing and around getting, you know, having enough time in between the books to properly market the books. Um, and it also saves me getting any more RSI in my shoulders and wrist <laughs> from from writing two books a year. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's it's honestly, I'm not complaining. It's a, it's an amazing way to 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 make a living. It's, um, you know, you dream up these characters and put them in these strange situations and yeah i you know it's, it's a terrific way to um to, to spend your time you've got a really lovely dedication in the front of this book as well yeah no it's actually yeah it's worth talking about this because um i i did awful at school i did really badly at school i went to probably what would be called an underperforming school in modern parlance in in kent it was you know, even though it was it was in a quite a wealthy town, Seven Oaks in Kent, but this was the place that the non-wealthy kids went to. Um, this is where all the council estate kids went to. So attainment was really, really low. But there were a couple of really great teachers there. My first ever form teacher was a guy called Mr. Chilvers. And he was a lovely man. And he really encouraged me and said, you're really good at writing. And then there was another teacher in the second year. I had this teacher called Mr. Yabakum who was a really kind man. And he said, you know, Neil, you've got really good, you've got lots of talent here. You've got a talent for writing and please don't lose it. And of course I just ignored them. I ignored them because I was too busy. I wanted to knock about my mates and get into trouble and do all the things that, you know, kids on the council estate did. Um, but I did read a lot. I read an awful lot. And that's what I think suspect what probably saved me. And Mr. Yabakum used to, 
talk to me after each English and say, what, what are you reading? What are you reading? And I'd say, well, I'm reading Desmond Bagley at the moment. I'm reading Alistair MacLean, you know, and I was reading all, at 12, I was reading these thrillers. And I just loved them. I couldn't get enough of them. And he was like, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant. Just keep going, keep going, keep reading. If you keep reading, everything will be all right. He literally said that. He goes, if you keep reading, it doesn't matter, but you know, everything will be fine. And then he went off to be a minister. I never saw him again. And um, he yeah, went and trained to be a fully blown priest. And then it came to it. And I, I, I left the police in 2015 and messed around for a bit for a few years. And then I decided, I wonder if I could write a book. So I wrote a book and eventually got published and then wrote a couple more. And then I got the published to the Craigie books. And I, then I started wondering, oh, why? I just remembered these two teachers who'd been really, really encouraging. Mr. Chilvers and Mr. Yabakin. And then Mr. Chilvers followed me on Facebook. And oh, brilliant. So I'm sent, sent a message saying blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, well, I need to find Mr. Yabakin as well. And um, so I looked him up and I sent an email to an old diff because he was running. A, a, he was a parish, been a parish priest in Norfolk. And I sent him an email on spec and he got back to me and he said, of course, I remember you. Of course, I remember you. And I'm, I'm overwhelmed that, you know, you're writing and maybe I played a part in that. So it was lovely to be able to dedicate this book to Mr. Yapicum and Mr. Chilvers because uh, it just struck me. And I just thought that all the people out there, maybe all the teachers, because a lot of teachers end up reading. The teachers love reading. And loads of teachers contact me and say, I'm, the, I'm a teacher and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, I thought it just goes to show that those words from my teacher back in what, the 1970s, late 1970s, saying, you've got a talent there, you can write, actually planted a seed in me that 40 years later, I thought, yeah, well, maybe I'll give it a go. And so, yeah, it really struck a chord. So it, and a few weeks ago, because um, I'd been in touch with Mr. Chills and Mr. Yabkin, and Mr. Chilvers said, can you come and speak at our Rotary Club on Zoom? And um, I said, yeah, sure, why not? So I, I tuned into that and Mr. Yabakum and Mr. Chilvers were there. And I was honestly, I was so pleased. I was so pleased. So, yeah, uh, absolute delight for me to be able to say thank you to these guys, you know, 40 years later, because um, they gave me the I maybe in deep seated belief that I could do this. So, um, yeah, loads of fun. Yes, like, I liked, sorry, I really liked it. It was a nice thing to read. Um, and yeah, as a teacher, we do like reading. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I've had loads of teachers reach out to me and say that, you know, I've been into, uh, I went up to, Dornick Academy, which is about an hour ago, an hour away from me, um, sort of a few weeks ago, and uh, I did a, I did, they got me doing back to back presentations in the hall to all the kids. I think they, I did three of them, and they said, right, Neil's going to be up in the library um, if you want to go and talk to him. And I thought, well, no, they're just looking at me as an excuse to get out of maths, and um, but there was a queue of kids wanting to talk to me about how did they you know how to become an author how do they do it what do they have to do where should they start and i you know what i'm not one for tiktok I'm not, i mean i've got a tiktok account i did it just basically to make sure my name was there but so many young people have been drawn to reading because of tiktok and i thought that was absolutely fantastic you know these i don't you know colleen hoover and a lot of the manga and stuff like that has been made huge by tiktok so we all slate social media and what it does to kids but i i know for a fact there are a lot of kids getting into writing because of you know tiktok and social media and things like that so there is positives to be had out of it so yeah i've got a, a great deal of pleasure talking to the english department and then going out and talking to all the kids so i came back absolutely buzzing from that school visit so I, i'm really delighted to see and the more if we can get kids reading i always say to my i say to my son and things like that i say if you read and read regularly and it doesn't really matter what you read, you'll do all right. Because I just think reading can solve many, many problems. Genuinely. That's nice. I don't think we've ever... Yeah, we, we did have an author in at our school, actually. The last reading-related thing we had in our school was Drag Queen Story Time, mm. which was absolutely brilliant. People are listening to stories, and um, it involves a book and not a screen. Because, you know, the, the screens are powerful things for kids. Um, 
I, I'm all for it. I'm I'm all for it. Me too. And you're right about um, book related TikTok. Although Sam signed us up for TikTok to do the UK Crime Book Club on it, and I can't. I can't TikTok. It's yeah. I I'm I'm struggling with it. I I mean I I can do it. I've put a few videos on, and if I if I get little video clips or anything like that, mostly I put videos of my dog and my cat for wrestling, <laughs> and that's fine. You know, I, and I I don't know anyone who follows me. I know everyone. Anyone who follows me on Twitter will know about Bin Day, and my my dog with the binman at the gate. Oh, I mean, it just I I think I had. I think I had 60,000 impressions on my last bin day. Um, so that's all. That's always good fun. That's always good fun. It's amazing. I told you, I, I thought like 40 odd thousand people saw it. I thought if they all just bought a book, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Are you following it on with the um, like the book link after? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I should do. I should be a bit smarter about it. Donna's just said your dog and cat are gorgeous, so I don't yeah, know no, following honestly, through by buying a book. Donna, uh, well, you need to follow it now with buying a book. Yeah, it's honestly no, they do. Honestly, they're here. They're hilarious. My cat, my we got our cat. My cat's only a big kitten, really, um, but her and the dog are falling in love with each other, and they're they're constantly wrestling and chasing mm. each other around. It's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry. I got distracted okay. by all the people making comments about your um, dog about, and cat. about the no, yeah, they're they're bigger stars than me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots of comments further up about Barney and Ross arguing with each other, and um, Leslie said that characterisation is really important. Like that's what makes really good crime novels, and I think that's true. So a lot of my favourite crime theories are the ones where you just really gel with the characters. Yeah. Oh God. I mean. It's so much that it is so much that I mean you 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 you're there because of the story, but you come back because of the characters. You want to you want to engage with the characters again. You know, I mean, why is why is Jack Reacher so popular? He's popular because people want to keep seeing what he's doing next. Why do people keep on reading Rebus? You know, Ian writes them in in real time, as in you know, Rebus gets a bit older each book he writes. He's that bit older, so everyone wants to say, well, where's he been? Where's Where's Reacher be? So, so having those characters and making them real, making them relatable, making them likable, even if they they have flaws, you know. I do. I mean, I'm, Ross is really foul mouthed, and I keep coming up with the more creative ways of of swearing and things like that. And I I do get the occasional one star review because of it, but I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. <laughs> I couldn't care less about that because. Because that's real life. Some people are like that, and uh, I'm such a fan of it. And I, I think this this creative, out of context swearing brings an awful lot to it, especially when nobody really reacts to him, um, which drives him insane. And the fact that he's got this, you know, he's. I mean, I've stolen it. Anyone who's old enough to remember Minder and Arthur Daly, who always used to talk about her indoors, his wife, who he clearly adored, but you never got to see her and you never got to hear from her. And that's where I've been with this. Like with Ross Fraser is always complaining about his wife, saying about Mrs. Fraser doing this, and Mrs. Fraser doing that, and um, and it just makes this make, it makes me chuckle that you know it it keeps happening. But he clearly, you know, he's this big softy, really. Uh, but he comes across as, across as this big evil misogynistic buffoon. But he's not. He's not. And, and we all know people like that. And I, I just want to, you know, because the. the I don't know. He probably wouldn't survive. He probably wouldn't survive in the real police. He'd get sacked because, you know, if he, he's called Jamie a soppy mare or something like that, someone would say that's misogynistic and get kicked out. But he's not like that. It's not, it's not real. He's just a good He's a good guy. He'll do anything for his people. So making the characters relatable, making people want to know about what they're doing, making people care about, care about them and, and, and care about what's happening in their lives and, and, where what are their vulnerabilities you know max has his vulnerabilities he's he does suffer from ptsd but he's not he's he's not on tenter hooks all the time he he manages it in his own way and he's he's in a fairly stable place with it he's not got alcohol issues he's loves his wife you know and he's a he's a good solid family man and he's deeply honorable 
Um, Janie's a bit more quirky, a bit quite straight. Um, and, you know, Barney's Barney. Barney doesn't care. Lives in his camper van, mooches about, puts in bugs, doesn't care. It's just fun. It's fun. It's the, it's the most amount of fun. I quite like Norma, who was really nerdy as well. Yeah, Norma's great. No, again, Norma came in in the uh, in the second book. She wasn't in the first book. Came in the first book, uh, in the second book. So I wanted to bring an analyst in because in uh, sort of an intelligence, police intelligence environment, any intelligence environment, you'll have obviously your operators who go out and do the work, but then you'll have your people back at um, you're back in the office doing the you know getting the information out. So you'd have your researchers and your analysts, and your analysts are there to make the connections to to you know to to look at the trends and to, to put it together put them in these big charts um called i2 i2 charts old people older officers will call them anacapa charts and they're these things where you can plot a criminal network so the whole point is you should be able to easily understand it by looking at it but that makes it funny for me because ross phrases and understand them he doesn't like them they think they're stupid um but then you know norma can unpick anything she can get to the bottom of it she can decode any sort of big pile of data and make it mean something because the books are quite tech heavy um an awful lot happens with phones phones are always a central part to any book i i write and that's because these things are look they're our personal they you know they're never far from us everybody watching this has probably got their phone next to them and these aren't they're not phones they're supercomputers that's the reality and i always try and say that to people it's not a phone it's a supercomputer because it can do everything it's tracking your every move it's saying what internet searches you're doing it's saying what shops you've been into and if you can get hold of one of them you know you can decode someone's life so I need an analyst to help me with that. So that's why I brought Norma in because I wanted to. And again, she's she's sparky. She's no shrinking violet. She loves the tonics tea cake. You know, she likes she loves a cake, loves a cup of tea. And um, she's very much part of the team, even though she never leaves the office. And I wanted that. I wanted that sort of person that's always in the office, able to make that phone call and say that phone's hit that cell site. You need to get there. Um Again, it's based in real life because when we were when I used to do some, I'd be on a surveillance operation for whatever reason it was, whether it was a homicide investigation or a major drugs investigation, we'd always have somebody at the end of the phone who was sat in front of a computer who knew their way around the intelligence systems, who knew how to, if they needed to, if we needed to get a ping on a phone, they could get that sorted. They could get a ping on the phone. They knew they knew who to talk to to make that happen. Um, so that that always you know that 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 became important to me and so she, she normally became very much part of the team mills says there she admits she's watching it on her phone but Nothing she also wrong. says your cat skateboards yeah no he did actually funny one that because we he is really bold he's a really bold brave cat well, my last cat was a real scaredy cat but um my son he just left his skateboard in the middle of the room the cat jumped on it and it started moving and he realized he could almost run and jump on it and he'd be flying across the room doing it himself so that's yeah yeah it's funny yeah skateboarding cat uh sarah wants to know how you keep track of your characters so how yeah. are you how are you keeping track of them do you use a note for a spreadsheet i don't do anything i just trust her luck and that's a concern because <laughs> i can't remember anything about them so i just i just skirt around it i I can't remember what anyone's eye colours are. And I know I've talked about eye colours in the book, and I, but I can't remember what they are. Um, I should be more, I should be, I should write a series Bible. I should go through and write a series Bible, but I've always been too busy because I'm always writing the next book. But yeah, what I should have done and what sensible crime writers or sensible authors writing series fiction do <laughs> is keep a series Bible where, you know, everyone's hair colour. I and mean, that's why I did Mac. Max is bald. He's not, he, he's, He's follically challenged and he shaves his head. So I don't, I don't have to remember anything about that. And beyond the fact that he's quite lean, I, I have no idea. And I don't know what he looks like. I can't picture him in my head. I can't picture any of my characters in, in, in my head. Part, maybe Barney. Maybe he's a, he's a short, tough, wiry little fella with grey hair. But that basically, I can't remember. I don't know what anybody looks like. So you've not, like, pictured your characters. You don't base not, them off anyone. You're not... 
Apart from no, the ones that are people you know, obviously. Yeah, no. Apart from people who are, who I know, um, and I've got you know that it keeps growing, and they keep keeping up. There's a I'm just I'm saying I'm writing the sixth Craigie at the moment, and there's somebody in there called Doreen Urquhart, who is a, a, a D a, she's a DC, and she's somebody who is what we they would call up here they call a productions officer. In England, they call them an exhibits officer. And they're the ones that deal with the, like the, the stuff that gets seized, so the, 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 the criminal exhibits, the, you know, all the evidence. And um, that all came to the fact that I did a I did an event in a local village hall here, and they said, "Do you fancy raffling off the you know being named as a character?" And so I said, "Yeah, why not?" And then somebody said, "Oh, my mum said, can you do my mum?" And I said, and "The mum's called Dory Nurkut." And she's just, I'm just writing about her again at the moment. And um, another one was, my son's a big skateboarder. We go to the skate park a lot with him. Don't go so much, he goes on his own now. But um, when he was going, there's a little tea sh shack at a mini golf place. And the guy who works there is the most outgoing man in the world. He really is. And I got, I got became quite friendly with him. He's a lovely bloke called Gus. And he goes, oh, go on, mate, put the, because put the, he works in a mini golf place where the coffee shack is. He goes, put the mini golf place in, go on, please, because, you know, it'd be like good. I went, all right. And so I thought I would just have a little meeting there or something like that. And I wrote it up and I thought, well, I might as well put Gus in there because he's quite a character. So I wrote him in as that. And he ended up with a major part in the book, a major part. It was really important and a number of really big scenes. And he honestly, he was made up. And um, I'm just thinking of a way of getting him back in again because he was such a, it was again, it was such a load of fun to write. And also, he's the most talkative man I know, even more talkative than me, which is hard to believe. But I know he's telling everybody around that this has happened and it's, it sells books, you know? So it's it's all a lot. Yeah, Sarah Blackburn saying the place in Inverness. That's right. Yeah, the mini golf place in Inverness where he like, meets him. He's, uh, he's an ex cop with a shady past, shall we say. And um, yeah, that was great fun. So I was really happy to do that. So I keep I keep chucking people in. It's um, and I'll keep doing that. It's loads of fun. It saves you having to come up with a character name as well. Well, yeah, and then it, when you think about describing them, and you normally you just come up, oh, you know, slim and blah, dark hair, or whatever. You just describe the actual person, and that's. I mean, you just got to make sure. I mean, the thing is with the one I talk about, Gus, right? With Gus, um, in this book, he's not particularly. Of sound moral, shall we say, he's a bit dodgy and he's done some badness. And I wrote it and I thought, oh Christ, I hope he's happy with this, you know, because he makes him. He's a bit of a bounder in this book. So I had to go and say to him, look, Gus, look, mate, I've written you into it, but you're a bit dodgy in it. Are you happy with that? And he goes, no, that's better. That makes it better. So, I, but I just put a little note in at the end of the book. I put an author's note in saying that everything I've suggested that Gus. Gus Fraser McDonald's done. He hasn't. He's a perfectly decent man. <laughs> so that's that's good fun as well. It's quite nice to live vicariously. I'm in a a book by Anne Coates, and I think I'm quite villainous in it. Like I'm yeah. How that's, cool I'm is like, that? I'm all right with that. That's quite fun. It's kind of yeah. nice to see yourself be someone. It is. It is. And my, my wife often will come and say, oh, do you, so and so is really going on. She really likes your book. Why don't, do you think do you reckon you can squeeze her in the book? And I'll say, well, I can I can come up with something, I suppose. And yeah, it's a bit of fun. You just got to be careful. You don't, you know, go too far with it. Just go, don't want to go too far. But it's yeah, it's a laugh. So um, Mill said that she sees Max in her brain as a shaven headed version of you. <laughs> he's much tougher than me <laughs> he's much more honorable and tougher than me i'm too i'm too lazy to be like max i do think oh god can't go home you know I'm, i just like being at home but yeah no that's very flattering no, thank you mills <laughs> uh sarah says she's been in a book by the bridge docks all right okay that's cool that's cool yeah it's nice it's a good thing to do lots of authors are doing it nowadays it's a, I, I appeared in a Stephen Leather book. He didn't tell me he was going to do it. Just that somebody, um, some, I'd, I'd had some back and forth with Stephen about, um, I can't remember what, because he blurred a couple of my books. And um, yeah, somebody said, have you read Stephen Leather's latest novella? He goes, no, well, you should read it. So I downloaded it and read it. Yeah, I'm a, I was an FBI agent in, in a Stephen Leather book. 
cool. It's very strange. <laughs> yeah, it's good when you get those like little crossovers, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, you, so you've got two long running series, never tempted to do like a standalone or anything? I can't too say too much. Ooh. I can't say too much is all I can say. However, uh, I'm not going to say no. That's all I can say on that front because there are contractual issues. But uh, yeah, I've got I've got a desire to write other things. I've got all sorts of desires. That this, if if I had more time, I'd be I'd, I'd write loads more. My I would I've got a, my granddad was a police officer in the, in Liverpool, in the toughest part of Liverpool, Scotland Road. Oh, it certainly was in the day, and uh, in 1919 he joined, just after the First World War. He fought in the First World War and then left and joined Liverpool City Police. And um, I managed to get his uh, police service history that got it. Someone sent to me this beautiful handwritten service history. And it was fascinating. So the trouble is it would take so much research to get it right. And if you write a historical fiction, there's got to be a lot right in it. I mean, you know, you can obviously it's still a work of fiction, so you can still make fiction. But what was happening in the day who was prime minister what what was the transportation like in those days did people have phones etc cetera, etc cetera. you got to get that right and I, i'm not sure i've got the stomach in me to actually do it but i mean i would like to to do it because some of the stories um you know about my granddad that became evident from his police record it would be fascinating um but I, I, I just think I'd have to do too much research. This is why I base books where I do and why I write about what I do. You know, I write about cops because I know what it's like to be a cop. Uh, my first series uh, was based in London. Um, I was in, you know, I was in a cop in London, so I know all about that. Um, and of course, now I'm living in the Highlands of Scotland. And, you know, I've made it that Max came from, you know, originates from down the road from me. His aunt, Auntie Elspeth, I don't know if people all know Auntie Elspeth, who is his... Um, his paternal aunt, his parents died years ago, but uh, he's left with his aunt. She's deaf and uh, she um, is a lip reader and all this sort of stuff. So I've managed to weave all that in. And she lives in the village just down the other end of the road. And I do that so I don't have to research. <laughs> I do. It so I can just know oh, I've been there. So I'll just write that. Um, and then I base it, you know, I like to base it all around. And and then, I, you know, quite often I'll write, I think I'll do it in that. I'll, I'll base this. So, so the second book I wanted to base, I, I, I needed to, I, I needed to see Loch for bringing drugs in. So I thought, well, Mount Loch Torridon looked best. So I did that and started writing. And then I got in my car and took a trip up to Loch Torridon, which is, which was, you know, beautiful. And then I could make it right. So I do, I, I like to write places that I know or I live near, so I haven't got to go mad on research because research is is really time consuming. And when you're writing two books a year, you, you haven't really got the time to do heaps and heaps and heaps of research when you balance it out against getting books written and uh then promoting them and having to you know go and do events and, and visits and go to bookshops and sign books and all things like that so what have you read this year that you've really enjoyed oh, oh i mean uh, by every step the best book i've read in oh God, so many years mills gone mills guests Mills, guess. I bet you get it right. Are you still watching Mills? Mills will get this right because I recommended it to Mills and she loved okay. it. She will be yeah. I'm sure she'll tell her the answer. Yeah. yeah. Strange. She's that Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent is by some distance the best book I've read this year or any year. Um, Liz, is, Liz is lovely. She's a, but she's a phenomenally talented. I don't, I can't think of a more talented author. Um, I've gone back and read her other books since reading it, but I got I got an early copy of it, and um, it's it's actually I'm very proud to say I think I was the first person to read it uh, outside her publishing house or Liz. I think I read it before her husband, um, so I'm really proud of that. And um, it is quite simply one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, it, it's just her char the characterization is is just mind blowing. She talks about this. Sally Diamond is this neurodiverse, 
but because of her situation, because of her upbringing, she's become neurodiverse rather than born neurodiverse. And I mean, it's got the best opening lines ever, basically. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it says, my father always said that when I died, just put me out with the bins. So when my dad died, that's what I did. And that's where the book starts. She put, I literally did put her dad out with the bins. It's an incredible, incredible work. But I've read, honestly, I've read loads and loads of great books. I read John Sutherland's latest book. Um, John Sutherland's an ex-chief superintendent. Um, and for the life of me, I now cannot remember what it's called. But it was absolutely superb. My problem is I read the books, but I can't remember what they're called. Um, I've read quite a few this year. Um, Jane Casey's latest is fantastic. Um, say jo uh, John Sutherland is he's he's written really good books around around a hostage negotiator, and they're extremely good, extremely good. He's a very talented man. He's a lovely man as well, lovely man. Um, so yeah, I've I've always got a book on the go. I've just started Kate London's latest book, which is called Miss Per. Um, Kate's an ex, another ex homicide detective. Um. And it's really, really good. It's shaping up really well. She did the ITV show. Uh, her book inspired the ITV show that was called The Tower. Really, really good. She's a terrific author. Um, I, I, there's so much, so many books I'd love to read, but you know, it's keeping up with them, yeah, as always. It's finding the time, isn't it? It's finding the time. It's, um, I also read another book called The Buyer. This is, hang on, I need to get this one right. I, and I took a photograph of it. This is by an ex-Met cop. What's his name? I have it here. Right. Liam Thomas. Um, it's the book called The Buyer. It's out, I think, imminently. Um, might be next week. And it is about his life. He was an undercover officer, proper undercover officer. Um, it is very brutal, very raw, very visceral. He was very badly treated by the Met Police. Um You'd need to read it to really get to it. I did blur. I put it out there on. I blurbed it on Twitter last week. It is an absolutely tremendous book. It's about his story about where he properly was in infiltrating some of the worst criminal gangs um, in London, in Liverpool, overseas, and he was very badly treated by the Met Police. Um, it's absolutely fascinating, and I am going to be doing an event with him at Bloody Scotland um, this year. We're going to be having an in conversation with on the Sunday, I think it is. Um, so, yeah, that's good. I'm really looking forward to that because the, the book is absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether I know him or not. It's one of those things. I don't recognise him immediately from the photograph, but then my memory is crap. Um, but, yeah, lots going on, lots happening, Lot, lots going on this year. Um, so I'm doing a festival. I'm doing Cromarty Crime this weekend. I'm on. Uh, I'm doing a panel with Mark Billingham. It's just me and Mark Billingham having a chat for an hour uh, on Sunday morning. I'm doing I Write. I'm doing Crime Fest. I'm doing Harrogate. I'm doing Butte Noir. And I think that's it. So if you go to any of them, come and say hello. I'll be at Harrogate. Good. Come, come and say hello. I'll be there. Uh, Mill said she's adding that book that you just said to her order list. From it is really good, Mills. It's really, really good. It's it's quite dark and it's written. His voice is, is absolutely beautiful. He's um he's got a really, really great writing voice, and he's um he seems to have this sort of internal monologue going on. And he's, he's, when he was working undercover, it seemed to be almost arguing with himself a lot of time inside. So it's quite it's quite visceral. Really good. Sarah is at Black uh, Harrogate. Come and say hello to me, Sarah. I'll be there. Take books, get them signed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm on a I'm on a panel at Harrogate with Jane Casey and Cara Hunter, and we are being moderated by Graham Bartlett, who is an ex detective chief superintendent. So, but I won't, I'm not calling him sir. Mm. That ain't happening. <laughs> Graham's like a nice. Um... He's quite a nice, chilled guy as well, isn't he? So yeah, yeah, lovely bloke. Love. He's a love. He's a lovely bloke. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Looking, looking forward to it a lot. My last um, five star read before yours was "The Maiden" by Kate Foster. Yeah, not read that. Not read that. And that's going to be there or thereabouts for me for book of the year, I think. Fantastic. Have you read "Strange Sally Diamond"? I have not yet. That might change your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I don't know. Actually, as well, because Sarah Moorhead has got a new book coming out this year. Right. Um, called The Treatment. And I read that a bit like you did. I read it while it was still with her agent. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's is, great to do. That is, yeah, I, I'm still so, like, it's probably the most honoured thing I've ever been asked to do in my life. Um, and that is, like, ridiculously amazing. Yeah. So it's... when that comes out, like, I'm going to find it difficult to narrow it down to a top one this year because that, that was my top book of last year, but I couldn't have it because it was... Not out until, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mills is saying I have to read Strange Sally Diamond. You do, you do. Honestly, you do. It will, um, it will, it will blow you away. It will. I well, I work with very neurodiverse people, so yeah. Be... Uh, Liz is one I of the most. Work. She's an incredibly <laughs> talented author, incredibly talented, and and to the, the way she writes, it's um, it's incredibly brave how she writes because she writes incredibly, certainly in that book, quite simplistically, um, but it's incredibly layered, and 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 uh, I don't even know how to describe it other than it, it made me think, oh, my God, I don't know anything. But then I came to realise, I mean, Liz is, Liz is great. She's read my book. She likes my books. And we're, we're different. We, we write differently, you know, and we write different stories that are for different things. And I can enjoy, you know, I can enjoy that as much as anybody. So very, I feel very privileged, you know. I feel very privileged to be doing what I'm doing. So before I ask you to remind everyone, because you've got three minutes left, you can have my last, um, you can have my favourite author chat question, um, which is, would you make a graphic novel of one of your books? Um, I mean, I, I can't, I can't draw a candlestick, but um, it would be really cool. In fact, there's a, there's an artist who is looking for some funding. She, uh, from, from Creative Scotland, she lives in, I think she lives in Wick, which is at the top end of the country. And she does these, they, they're lino prints and where they literally, she literally somehow cuts it all out of lino and then prints. And she sent me a message saying, I read your book. I really love your book. And I want to do some things with crime writers, Scottish crime writers. So she's doing it with J.D. Kirk. I think she's going to do it with Ian Rankin. I think she's doing it with Peter May, where she like gets in her head what the characters look like or some of the characters. Like. And she did a lino print of Tam Hardy, who's like the ultimate bad guy in my first Craigie book and it was fantastic so I think if she could come up with something like that and then come up with a, a, a graphic novel of one of the Craigie books I think that'd be fantastic I'd love to see it I wouldn't know where to start you know I'm gosh, like you say I'm useless at anything to do like that but um that that would be fantastic yeah and then you've got a minute left remind everybody what they're going to go away and be buying well I hope I mean, please help yourself to anything I've written, but I'm hoping you're going to go and buy Blood Runs Cold. Um, I, I think it's my most ambitious book yet. I think it's probably the best of the four. Um, and the reviews so far, probably better. I mean, that seems to be a common theme. It's the best reviewed book I've had. Um, it's selling quite well. So, yeah, if you're going to buy anything of mine, if you've not read it, then please do read it. Or if you want to start at the beginning with Dead Man's Grave and work your way through the series, then please do that as well. If you love an audio book, I think I've got the best narrator of uh, for Scottish books. Um, Angus King is incredible. Um, so, yeah, thanks for reading. Those of you who read, I genuinely appreciate that. If people aren't reading the books, it's just paper and glue, isn't it, you know? It's just words on a page, so it needs people to read it and and enjoy it. And um, I'm, I feel very privileged that people are enjoying it. And then all that's left to say is thanks for joining us. It's been a it's pleasure been, interviewing you. It's been my it's been my huge pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>